Lizzie Borden committed a crime that shocked the nation, or did she? Did you kill father? Ah! Hopefully it was Dude, short enough. That was short <laughs> enough. enough. It's one of the best TV movies ever made um, with Elizabeth Montgomery. As It really is. I, I don't know how they did it, what the budget was. I'm not alone in this, and I recently discovered that, but I, I didn't know the movie. But one of the best movies of the week, I think it was ABC that did it, uh, absolutely fantastic production values, and that's uh, obviously Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched, uh, mm -hmm. who does the killings in the movie naked, uh, which is one of the theories behind it. There's also the Chloe Zavigny, uh, uh, Kristen, uh, what's her name, uh, movie Chloe, Stewart, Kristen Stewart, also les naked. lesbian thrill killer, naked, uh, where Kristen Stewart plays. Bridget Sullivan, the Irish maid, we'll get into that. Uh, How about Christy Ritchie? Was she naked for hers too? Christy Ritchie. Or she... Christine Ritchie did. Uh, oh, Christina uh, Ritchie. Yeah. Okay. Christina Ritchie is kind of naked. It's direct. Uh, it's not a very good movie. It's directed by Nick Gomez, a guy that I uh, remember from New York as an indie film director. He later goes on to become a TV director. He directed Ill Town and New Jersey Drive. Uh, Jersey Drive. He was a indie act, indie uh, director in New York, uh, who won a couple of big awards and then went into TV. And he directed the one with Christina Ricci, um, which is is not very good. But nevertheless, whether they were naked or not, um, there's so much crap to this story that I have avoided it my entire life. I have avoided this story uh, simply because. I just thought it was one of these things that everybody knew she did it. And I was never interested, Eric. You know, I mean, even growing up, I just said, <laughs> ah, Lizzie Borden, she killed her mother. But I never looked into it. I never, ever looked into it. And for the past few weeks, I've been looking into it. And holy crap, are there dots to be connected in this murder? This is, like you pointed out, not only the crime of the century. I mean, it's 1892. Uh, but this has echoes of the OJ case, as you pointed out. This literally is, and I know they say this a lot about crimes of the century, uh, this is the biggest case in American history up until that point, and maybe till today. You know, no, I think it was this one, then it hit Lindbergh, then it hit OJ. I mean, if we're doing like the giant hits, but yeah. Right, but that's already sure. the 20th century. So yeah. this, oh, this, oh, yeah. is, this is still the 19th century, where fingerprinting has just been invented, but it's considered to be like wiretapping, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's considered to be a, a gauche to fingerprint someone. There's very few forensics involved. There's no DNA, there's no blood splatter. There's, they can barely separate animal from human blood, Eric. Uh, the police uh, don't question women. It's a Victorian mm -hmm. uh, gilded age, as we saw with the Age of Innocence. Uh, this era, and I've said before on this show, this era from the Civil War till now creeps me out uh, because it, it, the death and, and, and violence of this era has always creeped me out and freaked me out. And that's from 1865 up until 1900, 18, 1895. And I'll tell you why. They put bodies out in the, in the living room. They propped them up in caskets. They posed for family photos. Oh, yeah. of them. Yeah. So okay, well, that doesn't phase you, apparently. No, no, I mean... It phases, it was, phases it was, the shit out of me. It was a dark time. Go, go, yes, to, yes. go to a cemetery sometime and, and look at all the little tombstones from around this time period and before because life was so damn tough back then people yeah. you know that they, yeah, yeah. they would have the name john and that was the fourth try yeah. or susan you know and and all well, even i'm saying died. even the, the death of the murder which we're oh, going to get oh, into sure. people just walking through the house the, the whole neighborhood's walking through they're going look he's been shot mm -hmm. i mean there seems to be nobody is repulsed by it which i find to be creepy there's nobody <laughs> fainting. There's nobody throwing up. One, one cop goes out and throws up. But other than that, and people just go, hey, what happened? We, we lost, you know, a half million people in the Civil War a couple of years ago. What difference does it make? You know, I mean, it just seems like a laissez-faire attitude about death and, and especially murder. Um, 
the, we'll, we'll get into it. In a, in it a could also seconds. be too, because they were a lot closer to, um, to how they got their food. Now this is me throwing something out there, but you know, consider they butchered their own animals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, they grew up around yeah, death. Yeah and yep. things like that so yep. we've been distanced a bit more yes, we go to the yes. supermarket it's a little creepy yeah they didn't do that they literally had to uh, uh in, in fact there's an episode we'll get into in this story with her pet pigeons uh that doesn't go well for the pigeons but mm -hmm. let's just start at the beginning because people may not know who the hell lizzie borden is and what the deal is the bordens the borden family this, this is fall river massachusetts which is up on the border of Rhode Island, uh, up there, Massachusetts, um, where Fall River is an industrial textile mill town. And at this point in the 1890s, where this story happens, uh, there's immigrants coming to town. Not unlike today, people, tons of illegal aliens, in this case, from Portugal. The Portuguese, who now mm -hmm. still live in Rhode Island, as people of my friends from the Northeast, from Nantucket and Pawtucket and, and go scruck it, uh, lock it, um, all know that there's a huge Portuguese influence. They came in as laborers in these textile mills, especially in Fall River. Uh, the Borden family, there was 152 Bordens in the, in the, in the uh, registry, by the way. This is not the only Borden family. There's 152 of them. They founded the town. Uh, they go back to the Mayflower. They're all not wealthy, but in this case, the father, among everyone else of the Bordens, is wealthy. And mm -hmm. he's worth, as Eric and I have discussed, at his demise, uh, which will come at the end of this, in the middle of the story, he ends up being worth about $15 million in U.S. Uh, current money. It's about He left an estate of 500000 300 in cash and benefits and everything, and about, about another $150,000 in real estate. He had tons of real estate around the town. And anyway, so Borden himself comes from, uh, this particular Borden comes from a lesser stock of Bordens, not born into wealth, self-made man. Uh, yeah. The father was a fish peddler, a fishmonger. Uh, but nevertheless, they're all from this town. Borden himself will start out as a mortuary attendant. He will cut, design, and build coffins in the town. And if you're, I don't know how to say this, but if you were too long for his economic coffin, uh, he chopped off your feet at the ankles to fit you in the coffin. Okay, that's a little sick. That's part of one of the million. <laughs> no, no, but I'm saying it's one of the million reasons I can't stand this era because they did macabre shit, Eric. That's, I think, what's bummed me out. There he is. It's a little bit younger. That's uh, well, this is when he's cutting off the feet to okay. uh, fit in the coffin. I'm oh, my God, <laughs> Dude, that's Andrew Borden, Andrew, Andrew Borden, uh, the feet cutter. So he um, has to do some embalming. Uh, who knows what was going on down there? But he has two daughters. One of them is Emma. The other one of them passes away. The wife is Sarah. He marries this woman, Sarah, uh, and she dies about two and a half years after Lizzie is born. So, but keep in mind, her sister, Emma, is, which one is this? Sarah, the mother. Oh, this Sarah, okay. Oh, she's still alive, look at her. Look at her, that's so creepy, Eric. Oh, I thought you would appreciate it. Dude, you're freaking me out here. Like you're gonna, <laughs> are you going to do that to everybody? I'm going to leave. I have a lot of them. I, I have a it. lot of them, dude. No, this stop is it. Gonna be perfect. The haunted out, episode. Bro. Good. Anyway, so, oh, Jesus, I'm sick. The, the sister, Emma, is about 10 years older than uh, uh, Lizzie. Uh, so the mother dies when Lizzie's about two, two and a half. So really what happens is you've got a widow in, in the father and you've got the sister, Emma, who takes up the slack as the mother of Lizzie. Okay, just so you understand the family dynamics. They live in a shithole house. Now the shithole house, I don't know if you have a picture of the house, but we'll get into that. That's Emma, the sister. They, he, he <laughs> to say this guy is frugal is an understatement. This guy is like, what, what's the guy's name on, on the Simpsons? Homer? Or no, no, I don't know the rest no, of the, show. The, the Mr. Burns. This oh. cat is like Mr. Burns on The Simpsons or Scrooge or a combination of all these guys. Um, he lives in a house that is one house, one tenement house on top of another that he bought. And he makes it into a giant one family house. 
uh, right in the middle of town, right on Second Street. Everyone else in the Borden family lives up on the hill or in the hills. He stays in the middle of town so he can walk to his properties. He can collect rent. He can go to his two banks where he's a vice president of the banks now. Uh, this is when the girls are, are older. Uh, he will go through a bunch of different um, careers where it's money after money after money after money generating more money, uh, where he buys property. He becomes a mortuary guy, then the property guy. That's now. But th that is yeah. renovated now. I'm talking about the house, how it looked back in the day, the murder house, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll get into because we need to look at the house in terms of the murder itself. Because uh, there's a lot of physics involved with the murder in the house, uh, which will show Second Street. Uh, this is on Second Street in Fall River, which is kind of a main drag. Uh, so it's very busy. It's not like they live in the woods. Uh, and and you say to yourself, well, Lizzie Borden, the sister, maybe they were wackos. OK, they grow up. Neither one of them ever has a date. Either one of them ever has a suitor. They're not ugly. They come from money. And the only thing you can come from that, uh, 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 figure out from that is the L word. Now, here's the house. Now, this is one floor on top of another floor that was a tenement house. There's no hallways. Just keep this in mind. This is really bizarre. There's the barn in the back. That'll come into play. There's no hallways in this house, which is also creepy. Every door opens up into another door, if that makes any sense, Eric. The, yeah. the, the door opens up, the door of her bedroom opens up into the bedroom of her sister. The door in the living room opens up to the door in the kitchen. There's no hallways. You come but in. I, I think they did that back then for the circulation of the air. And also, highway hallway would be wasted space it's, if you're in a tiny it's house. It's the second answer. It's the second answer. You stumbled onto it. So there's here's the, the, the really strange thing. There's no running water. There's no electricity, although electricity exists. He refuses to even upgrade from the whale lamps that he's using of whale blubber oil in the house. There's a stove that's in there that they have to light every morning to get the stove going uh, for whatever they're going to cook. There are there is a double banger in the basement of a porta sand, if I whatever you want to call that, a, a water closet is two holes in the floor, there's a pump on top of the kitchen sink, a giant pump with a handle to pump water. And then there's another pump with water in the barn. And that's it. That's the entire essence of plumbing, heating, air conditioning, no electricity, although it exists. These are not impoverished people. The guy's worth a fortune and the daughters are not happy about it. Let me just lay that foundation out. But you know, there's people who said he was cheap with his daughter. I mean, he sent Lizzie to Europe. There's Lizzie on the right, and that's Emma on the left. Again, Emma is 10 years older than Lizzie. At the time of the crime, the time of the crime, sounds like a good thing. The time of the crime, the girl on the right, Lizzie Borden, is 32 years old. Her sister is 42 years old. They're still living at home. They're not ugly. They're not disfigured. The family has money. The father must be ready to kill himself uh, because why would these two still be living at home, Eric, at this time? Um, okay. So after two and a half years, the wife dies. He remarries. He marries a 230 pound woman uh, named Abby, uh, who becomes his new bride. Now, her family's local too. And they have some pockets of money in her family. Uh, but she is another spinster who has nothing going on. And she's no spring chicken either. Uh, I think she's about 47. Uh, you're freaking me out here. This yeah, is this so her at 49. So it's 49. When oh. Gets... oh. Ah! Ah! <laughs> you're creeping me out, bro. Good. <laughs> I can't take it. Anyway, so it. there is a battle royale. Uh, within the family about the daughters and their money, um, which, uh, you know, he's tight fisted, whatever. He loves his daughters. You know, she graduates from high school. He She gets her graduation ring. She puts it on her father's finger. She loves her father. Her father loves her. He's the She's the apple of his eye. Uh, nobody knows what happened. You know, maybe there's some darkness there. We don't really know. 
They have another daughter that dies uh, at a very early age. That's why the age separation of 10 years. Yeah, yeah. there's one that, that died uh, very young. So this woman, Abby, who comes in, is not respected as their mother. They perceive her to be a gold digger. And they may not be far off because she gets her husband to transfer some properties to her family. And this gets the two daughters very nervous because they know that that man on the left, who retired at the age of 52, by the way, he's now 70 when this story takes place, Eric. They know that he's not long for this world. And they are in such a frictional relationship with their stepmom that they fear, and it's not wrong, that she will kick them to the curb when and if this their father dies. Now, the, the, apparently there's no will uh, running around, or there is a will, and somebody gets it because... Uh, it, no will ever materialized. Uh, so this story makes makes sense in terms of the people who think she has a motivation to do this. But let's look at her life. She is a feminist before this feminism. She's a Sunday school teacher, teaches uh, Portuguese immigrants Christianity. She's in charge of one of the top people of the Women's Temperance Union uh, to stop alcohol uh, uh, drinking and will lead to successful repeal of the right to drink alcohol, prohibition. Um, she is involved in feeding the homeless Thanksgiving dinners every Thanksgiving. She is not narcissistic. She is not selfish. Uh, there are characteristics of her. Everyone in the town loves her. She's mm -hmm. not an isolated nut. There's been no examples of her being a nut. Her sister uh, was the quiet one, ironically. Her sister was quiet. She was gregarious, uh, Lizzie. Emma was quieter and kept to herself. Uh, neither one of them had a huge social life. Uh, the father didn't want them going out alone, uh, with un unaccompanied. Uh, whether they were pre-lesbians or lesbians, I don't know. Um, we're going to get into that because some people have suggested that. That's what it happened. could be that it could also be that they were trapped in a class problem. Like, it wasn't like she was going to marry a Portuguese person at the time or whatever. No. And she was too rich for a lot of people who might be suitors. So she could have actually been um, too upscale oh. but downscale at the same time to fit in. Like, she didn't fit in with the other, quote, rich people because they lived like, you know, paupers in a way. But yet she also, who's she going to bring home? Well, so she goes to Paris. Thing. She goes to Paris the year before the murders mm -hmm. uh, with the other Bordens from up on the hill or her cousins. So it's a huge family of wealthy cousins who go to Paris with her, uh, and, and she explores Europe uh, like any other wealthy chick would. She's not happy about living in this house, but, but definitely sure. Right. But would you be? <laughs> well, if I had that money. Well, there's a robbery a few months before the, the, the murders, and the police show up, and the stepmom's jewelry and money and train tickets from her drawer are robbed and the police show up and everyone believes that Abby uh, was robbed by her stepdaughter, Lizzie. Now, why do you suggest that? Well, well maybe is the reason. Lizzie was a kleptomaniac and she would go to these stores and steal from all the stores in town, almost like Winona Ryder. Uh, she liked the thrill of stealing and the father just said, put it on my bill. So nobody gave a shit that he, she stole anything from anybody's store. But she may have stolen from her own stepmom. And the police made a note of that in their files uh, that she may have been the one who did. It was never resolved. The father is always trying to make these things go away. He has no respect for the law. He is a total businessman. And he believes the law can get in the way of business people. You know what I mean? Like it can get in your way. Like if somebody was murdered, it would just be an annoyance to him unless it involved him, of course. But he, he was he was not a guy who was a pro government. He was a conservative Republican. They read the Providence paper, which was a, a conservative Republican paper at the time. Um, this was a guy who was pure business. Uh, there's the trolley. That's Fall River. On the right is the bank. You'll see with those arches over there with the columns. That's one of the two banks he was vice chairman of uh, on the right. Uh, this is a guy who everybody knows in the town. This is not an obscure figure. This is one of the leading 
men, economic men in Fall River, Massachusetts, which is an old town with a lot of New England Yankee roots and a lot of deep Americana going on in that town, Eric. Yeah, and he probably, I mean, it's not surprising, especially being um, upper class like that and having influence and connections that he doesn't need the cops. They would probably be a pain right. in his ass. That's what I was kind of getting at. He can make, <laughs> yeah, he can make a call. <laughs> and he does make calls. You know, in fact, when, when, when the cops show up for the robbery, he's kind of upset about it. When the doctor comes from across the street, he's upset about it. He said, who called you? You know, when the when the crimes happen, the doctor, you know, they, there's three doctors. There's two Catholic ones right across the street. They're not even considered doctors by these Protestants who look down upon the Catholics uh, with incredible viciousness. I, I mean, it was extremely surprising. Now, within the house is Bridget Sullivan. Now, Bridget Sullivan is a 30-ish year old Irish immigrant uh, uh, maid who had worked in another house, had been there for a couple of years now, two, three years uh, maybe four years working there. They call her Maggie. You know why they call her Maggie? Can't be because they, every every one they have, they just call Maggie. Every server, they go, "Hey, it's a new Maggie in town. Hey, let's go, Maggie. Get get my clothes." So, but her real name is Bridget Sullivan. Incredibly thick Irish brogue, completely Irish. Uh, hard to understand her. Um, and the two girls, you know, they got along with her. They didn't overwork her. The stepmom was a clean a phobe. So the stepmom cleaned all the time. The two girls cleaned all the time. I'm talking about dusting and laundry and everything. So they didn't, and they overpaid her. Uh, they treated her very well. She got $4 a week, which is more than a cook would get. Um, Bridget uh, was treated like gold by this family. And um, whatever happened with her, we're going to get into it, but uh, it, it's, it's a woman who may or may not have been involved in this crime. We don't know. Okay. So Lizzie is upset because her father wants to sign over one of the properties to the sister of the stepmom who is going to be evicted from her house. And the stepmom goes to the husband and says, can you please purchase this property that my sister is in so I don't have to worry about her being evicted. So the husband says, sure, what do I care? Um, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. Keep in mind. Which is unusual for him, though, because he's so cheap on everything else. But not with family. A dollar is $30. A thousand dollars is $30,000. I just want people to understand the mathematics of the time. Uh, uh, it's 30 times what we are, what they were then is equal to today. A dollar is $30. So when I said he was $500,000 that he left in his estate, uh, multiply that by 30 and you have his total wealth at the end of his life, uh, which will come into play because the end of his life is coming pretty soon <laughs> in this story. So, okay. So he buys this house for his wife uh, and she, give, it's her sister's in it. The two girls freak out. They completely freak out because they believe that the father could die at any moment. They're leaving property. They think the gold digger mom is extracting property from the, the father and working him as a gold digger. It's not really true. The mother, the stepmom, is really just this unbelievable overeater who can't stop eating. She can't leave the house. She is like one of those, what's it called when they have those shows on TV where the, the fat person's in the house, they can't get out. This woman weighs 230 at this point. She weighs 230 pounds. Uh, she can't leave the house unless it's a carriage. She does go out by carriage, but not on foot. She can't, she can't make it that far on foot is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but she's in the house cleaning. The maid is cleaning. The girls are cleaning. Lizzie's got the big room upstairs. She swaps rooms with Emma. Emma's now got the little room up there. Uh, but that being said, it is the biggest heat wave in the history of Fall River that week that this event happens. And it's 100 degrees, 100 degrees humidity. And they have to start a stove in the morning to cook their crap. Uh, so every morning, this maid, it's ridiculous. The maid gets up and starts the stove, you know, by putting wood in it. And you're, you're talking about heating up the house. She lives on the third floor. In the attic bedroom, okay. He rises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no fans. There's nothing. So a guy shows up. This is interesting. The day before this, the murders. This guy shows up 
named Uncle John Morse. I don't know if you AI this guy because that would really creep me out. Oh, don't worry, it's coming. Oh no, <laughs> Hanley! No, uh, I, I, I will be I will be nice to you for a moment, but oh, uh, but, no. but, but the, the AI is coming. There he is, all pretty and still. Oh, that's okay. I can live with that. That's what no, no, no. Like. It's coming. It's oh, no. coming. No, it's coming. It's coming. No. I promise. No. No, uh, no, no. I don't want you to feel left out. Okay, so the 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 father, this is the brother of his dead first wife. Yeah. John Morris is the their uncle from the dead initial actual mother. Uh, he shows up. Where was he before? He was in Iowa. He, of course, he showed he and he's from that that, that town. He was in Iowa, living in Iowa. Why? I have no idea why he was living in Iowa. Shows up. He's on foot. He doesn't even have a horse, uh, which is kind of weird. And he goes up to the guest bedroom and he he's staying up late at night talking business with the father and the father likes him. The two of them get along. But the, the girls are thinking, like, what is this now? We don't have a will. We have no we don't have a leg to stand on. The 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 this guy shows up, Uncle John, who's kind of sketchy. Uncle John used to be a butcher among other professions. He had a specialty. He had a specialty as a butcher. Yes. Uh, he used a tool. But he was a very quiet man. Thing. He was a quiet <laughs> Yankee man. Both of them were. They, these guys, if they spoke 10 words in the course of the day, it was literally for business purposes. They did not waste or mince words. Uh, uh, John Morris and also um, uh, at, at Lizzie's father. So the two of them stay up in the dark. You know why they stay up in the dark? To save money on whale oil. OK, they sit there in the dark having a business conference, the two of them in the downstairs in the sitting room, which is, again, creepy as shit. So eventually he goes up to go to bed. Uh, John Morris, he goes to the guest room. I don't know if you have a layout of the house or maybe there's a number. layout. If you did, if you don't, it's cool. There, there's a bunch of. Uh, um, oh, boy. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hanley. Oh, no. I, I can't even look at this. You're, you're freaking me out. bro. This is so creepy. Uh, okay. Is he gone? All right. He's gone. So anyway, so he goes up to the guest room and he sleeps, gets up whenever he gets up six o'clock in the morning, like these people did back then. And he comes downstairs and the father's there. And the day before, everyone had gotten sick the day before. Uh, he wasn't there yet. They kept eating this mutton stew. And why they kept eating the mutton stew, um, that is the house. That's not that house. That's the house she's going to buy, right? Oh, is this Maplecroft? Okay, that's Maplecroft. I wasn't clear. No, that's, okay. that's not it. Because that's, that's Maplecroft. Anyway, they eat this mutton stew and get sick as dogs because it's been, they have no refrigeration. Okay. The <laughs> ice man shows up, leaves some ice on the door and a chest, but they have no refrigeration. So the mutton stew is served for three consecutive days with fish in between. Uh, the fish could go bad. It's 100 degrees outside. They, they just put it in a cupboard, the stew. I mean, think about this. I, there's no refrigerator. Uh, they just put it in a cupboard, just stew, you know, a, a mutton stew, a mutton soup also. All of them are going outside and throwing up. Abby believes that the daughters, now here's where it gets interesting. Abby believes the daughters are trying to poison her, not from the mutton stew, but the mutton stew is one of the things that they believe, she believes, is an attempt to poison her, to get rid of her. The uh, girls uh, may or may not be trying to poison her to get, get rid of her. We don't know. She goes to the store. This is, again, uh, uh, no, no. She goes to the store two days before to see this guy, Eli Bentz. And Eli Bentz is the pharmacist in town. And Eli Bentz uh, will testify in the case that Abigail, uh, that uh, uh, Lizzie came in and asked for a prusic acid. And, she, and the guy said, what do you want that for? And she says, I need to clean my coat with it. Is this, this He's an honest broker. Oh, no, you freaky <laughs> guy. Dude, that freak. Eli Benz. Okay, so he's the pharmacist. And he Crushing says, hmm. I got a Monty <laughs> Python or something. I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> okay, so Pr Prusik, I know. This prusic acid is 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 so deadly it was so deadly Cyanide. it was used by the nazis to create zyklon b okay so that's how deadly it is it smells like almonds by the way in case you ever smell almonds yeah it's literally cyanide yeah it, right right yeah but it has a nice has a nice almond smell well yeah uh, go, goes down easily so he eli benz to his credit says to uh, her you have to have a prescription from a doctor. I can't just sell you a Zyklon B over the counter to kill future Jews. 
uh, you have to have a prescription. So she goes, all right, well, I've gotten it before. I'll get it where I got it before. And the guy goes, all right, but you're not getting it from me. So it's, she can't steal it because it's behind the counter, Eric, in the pharmacy. But mm -hmm. there's an attempt, obviously, by her to get poison or, in this case, cyanide. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it was for her, her, her uh, shoes or her suit, as she claimed. Now, in the barn are her beloved pet pigeons. And you say, well, how beloved could they be? She left all of her money to the unethical treatment of animals. Before there was PETA, there was this group, this pre-PETA group. She left all of her money. She loved animals more than one of these people who loved animals more than she loved people. You've heard it since the 1970s in America. She was the original I love animals more than people person. Okay. She had these pet pigeons in the barn and her father a couple of days before took an ax or hatchet in this case and chopped their heads off and you go well that's pretty harsh the father said he was chopping the heads off uh, to prevent the local boys from stealing the pigeons uh, that's the story the father gave uh, when confronted by his daughter who freaked the f out over the dead pigeons that's logical well, if they're not there, I, nobody could take them. Well, some people suggest it was in retaliation, and this is one of the rumors, uh, for Lizzie chopping off the head of Abby's cat. Okay, so th this, this, we don't know. We don't know. That was in the newspapers at the time that she had a cat that was beheaded. Uh, maybe this, as you are well aware, many serial killers, many mass murderers start off with animals, Eric. Um, oh, so the, you know, animals, bedwetting, and fires. Right. Okay. So if this cat was beheaded and her parents were beheaded a couple of weeks later, <laughs> it might be symbolic of her, you know, uh, trying it out. Anyway, so she flips out about the dead pigeons. They're in the barn. The barn's pretty big. Uh, who knows what's in the barn? Um, there's a water pump in the barn. Uh, so the day before this guy Morse shows up, and Morse says he's going to go to this other property, some farm that the father owns, and he's trying to buy that property from the father so he can have this farm of his own since he just moved back from Iowa. Uh, we don't really know uh, if that was true or not. We don't really have a sense as to what this guy was. All I know is that Lizzie didn't like this guy. And when he showed up, which was not the first time he's shown up because he's shown up various times in their lives keep in mind they're 32 years old these are not children the media makes it out to be like his daughter uh, teenage daughters did it they're not teenage daughters i thought that too she's 32 freaking years of age and the other one is 42 years of age so i mean keep that in mind when you think about these two innocent girls so meanwhile uh you know the neighbors are very close by physically the houses you could, I don't know if you could see this, but the house next door is literally like 15 feet to the left of that house. And in the yard, uh, you can sort, yeah, of, see it you can sort of see how close these ha and look on the right. See how close that house is. There's a side door to the back left all the way in the back. And that door is used to go out to the barn. There's the front door. Now, in the morning, somebody shows up. There's sketchy people in the front yard. There's sketchy people on the street. There's a, two guys in a carriage. This is all from reports of neighbors uh, because people know when people are moving around their neighborhood back in those days. There was uh, a, two guys in a carriage, a horse-driven carriage, and nobody knew who they were. There was a guy who knocked on the door, had the door slammed in his face, who may have been a courier or a delivery boy, uh, but we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. But it was also in the middle of downtown. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's possible there's a lot of traffic and things. There is a yeah, lot of traffic, but people know who these people are. There was one true. guy uh, waiting just across the street, just pacing, that people said this guy was obviously waiting for somebody. He wasn't walking. You could tell mm -hmm. when someone's pacing around waiting, true. you know. Okay. So the uncle gets up at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, and he has breakfast. And of course, as a tradition in the Borden household, you're forced to eat a uh, cold mutton soup, right? 
So he eats it. I guess he's got an ironclad stomach. I was going to say, he didn't get sick? (laughs) He's the only one. Lizzie didn't eat it. The rest of them ate it. The maid ate it, sick for days. Uh, All of them sick for days. Lizzie laid off. Uh, The sister, Emma, says, I'm going out of town to to Fairchild or some uh, some other town to get some dresses made and see our cousins. So she inexplicably bolts the day before the murders. She gets she gets out of Dodge. She goes off on a trolley car. She goes off uh, uh, 15, 25 miles away to another town uh, where she doesn't even know what's going on. But she is trying to calm Lizzie down. Now, Lizzie has epilepsy. And when I say epilepsy, I mean migraines, then epilepsy, and then blackouts from the epilepsy, where she <laughs> blacks out. Yeah. And apparently... Uh, from what the research I did on this type of epilepsy, which is temporal epilepsy, this is not somebody writhing around having a grand mal seizure on the ground swallowing their tongue epilepsy. This is people who can ski down a mountain and get to the bottom and not realize they skied the entire mountain. This is about asking for a raise on a job and not even know that you asked for a raise from a job. So it's there like is, a blackout almost. It's a brownish blackout. Absolutely. There are tons of these studies of these epileptics who did stuff in the blackout, including violent stuff, Eric. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, that's why I was like, okay, I see. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, this is where we're going. <clears throat> and she is known to have this type of epilepsy uh, where she didn't know what happened and she would do things that she doesn't remember, all physical things. Well, that would explain the kleptomania excuse, because I'm sure that the dad would be like, she probably doesn't know she did it. She probably she just forgot to pay. Yep. She probably really and that was true. wasn't the thief. That was true. She robbed her own mother and didn't remember her doing it. She did all these things and legitimately, she, she, everybody said one thing she was not was a liar. She never lied in her life about anything. And everyone agreed that her character was above report. This is one of the problems with the case. Hmm. And this, this is one of the big problems. You've got one of the upper crust people in the town who is not a slouch, who hmm. is not a durst uh, in, a, in a real estate sense, who is literally the Christian Sunday school teacher, who's not a pervert, as far as we know, who's not uh, 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 salaciously sexual, who is, you know, doing all the right things, and yet she is the one who is going to be charged with these heinous crimes. And we're going to get into why she's charged with these heinous crimes in a couple of minutes. But let me just put put it this way. Morse has the breakfast, and he says, I'm leaving to go to the property outside of town, this farm that he wants to buy. The father tells him to come back for dinner, which he will do. The father says, come back for dinner. The father at nine o'clock and 9 o'clock, the same time that this guy leaves, Morris, he leaves to go make his rounds. And his rounds are to go to the bank, go to the post office, collect his rents. He would evict people if they um, were an inch behind on their rent. He was had enemies, Eric. The guy had a lot of enemies in that town. Uh, especially among poor people, especially among the Portuguese, especially among the people he evicted. If he found out that Eric Hundley was making more money through some surreptitious means, he'd raise your freaking rent. <laughs> no, no. I mean, think about that character, that mindset. You've got to hide your income from your landlord who, if he finds out that you had a good month in the textile mill, he's going to raise your rent and vice versa. If you're late by a day, He's tossing you out. So this guy was not well loved. He was a a harsh, brutal businessman who had love for his children, if that makes any sense. And that's about all he had love for was his own family. No, there's a lot of those. I know. know. Take care of their own. They don't give a damn about anybody else. Especially with his upbringing, because remember, he he had the poor father. Yep. So it was, all of his cousins were rich. He wasn't rich. He had to scrape and get everything together to pull himself up to the same level right. as the others. Right. Now, one of the neighbors is is Alice uh, uh, Manley Russell. Uh, she is a bigger friend of Emma than she is of Lizzie. But nevertheless, she's a friend of both of the sisters. Yeah, that that's not a flattering picture. And don't try to AI that or I'll throw up. 
<laughs> it's all I could get, dude. It's a courtroom sketch. Yeah, but, it's a, yeah. It, there's not many photos of. of no, oh, I think there's one at the end of her life. There's yeah, one but, at, but yeah. she's so. This is okay. This is literally from the old folks' home. Forty-five yeah, years. years later. Yeah, that's at so the very, very yeah. end of her life. Yeah. Um, wow. So oh, okay. So anyway, so the, she these this got this street stuff going on. We don't know what's going on on the street. There's various people, interlopers. We've got, get this, because of the illegal, illegal aliens, we've got a crime problem. We've got people stealing stuff. we got people who are violently robbing people now. And the people like the Bordens are completely up in arms because their town is now overrun with Portuguese immigrants. And they're not even the same religion uh, as these people. So uh, the Irish are despised. But now the Portuguese are even more despised because they just got here and they're all illegals. So there is a crime problem in the town. Uh, let me just put that out there for those who think this is an open and shut case. It's not. It's one of the least open and shut cases in American legal history, as a matter of fact. And people seem to think that they know the answer, as did I. Uh, I have gone back and forth on this a million times, and it's still hard to figure out what the hell happened here. So uh, Morse goes on his way. He takes a, a streetcar uh, named Desire and he goes out into the hinterlands <laughs> and he will come back later uh, dinner time ish or, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon whenever he came back before. Yeah, he went out to visit this guy, um, Daniel Emery, whoever, if that matters. Uh, it doesn't really matter because I think what really matters is the fact that they were losing another property. And the girls were not happy about losing that property either. So dig what happens. The father sells them an entire house for $1. He sells the sisters one of the bigger houses he has in town and says, here you go, girls. This is your house. Do what you want with it. It's got tenants in it. Collect rent. You could keep busy. This is the house. He sells them for a buck. They get bored. After a number of months of being the landlords and whatever the hell you got to do for this job, uh, and they sell it back to the father for $5,000. Now, multiply that, and you tell me how much money that is, where it's $30 to a dollar. 150 grand, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. She puts uh, 2000 in her checking, 5000 in her uh, 2000 in her checking, 500 in her savings. Uh, she's loaded for bear, money wise. All of this stuff that. Uh, these rumors that they were impoverished by the father or a crock of shit. Uh, Emma was going to have some dress made. They, they would have a dressmaker every year show up and live in the house for two weeks, making them dresses from the top patterns of Europe and France and Italy in the house. She had a walk-in closet, Lizzie, of dresses, and she was a big, burly woman. Uh, this was not uh, someone who was uh, petite. The sister is a lot more petite than she is. Uh, but uh, Lizzie, oh boy. oh boy, you're talking about Lizzie now. I don't oh know, buddy. Boy. She only took, She's she only took, oh <laughs> oh, you freak. Ah, ah. <laughs> she only took photos or, or sketches of paintings uh, front on uh, because if she turned and you saw the silhouette, it was huge. So, okay, so she has petticoats. She's got these bustier things. She's got girdles. She's got all this crap on her, right? Her hair is impeccable. Her nails are impeccable. The 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 morning of uh, this situation, and I'll say situation. This guy leaves, gets on a trolley car, a streetcar named Desire. The father goes out on his rounds. So what is what does Abby do? Abby goes up to change the sheets and pillowcases on the bed of the guest in the guest room. Now, he's supposed to come back and sleep over again, Uncle John, but I guess it's a tradition to make the bed, Eric, right? And to redo the bedding and whatever. Yeah, for guests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, I don't know if she's replacing it, but she's going to redo redo or make the bed or whatever. Now, now, she goes to the maid, and the maid is throwing up. The maid is sick. It's 100% humidity, 100 degrees out. And she tells the maid, who she never really bossed around, uh, to... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's Bridget. She's not yeah. feeling well. Be nice. Oh, my God. She goes out in the yard. By the way, you would take a bucket of your feces and urine, which her father did uh, when he woke up and dumped it in the yard. 
that's how they dealt with their uh, morning stuff. And she goes right out there in the yard where there's this pear tree that's going to come into the story. She goes out in the yard and throws up. Everyone goes out in the yard and throws up. Uh, I don't know what's going on in that yard, but she's throwing up in the yard. And and the stepmom says to her, I'd like you to clean the windows on all around the house. All and, of them, yeah. No, no, all of them. <laughs> show, no, show that photo of the house. Show the second <laughs> floor of the house. Because I you got to understand this. It's the hottest day in, in memory in Fall River, breaking all records. Look at the second floor. Look, mm -hmm. <laughs> look where these windows are. And she's sick as a dog. And she's that's exactly what you want to do. I mean, she should have killed them all just from her telling them that. I mean, uh, well, that question has come up. <laughs> there okay. could have been involvement. So, so apparently there's a whole series of locks and bolts on the inside doors because they've been robbed. Right. And there's keys and all kinds of things. Basically, because they're right there at ground level, they're right on Second Street, they're right in town, there's tons of Portuguese immigrants running loose, people have been robbed, and so they are completely paranoid of telling each other, uh, I'm going out, lock the door, that kind of stuff, Eric. I'm, lock the door after me, I'm going to the barn. Lock the door, put the thing, put the bolt, I'll be, I'll be right back. Leave the door, all that Michigas. It was going on in this family for a year. Um, Which is a big deal, because back then, that was the time, I mean, yeah. all, all the way to the 50s, people did not lock their door. Well, they in did most in this places. Town, well, they, No, they did there, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So that's saying that they'd be a little on edge. Right. But what I'm trying to set the groundwork for is this immigration crime thing that's been going on through, through uh, Fall mm -hmm. River um, because of this massive illegal alien thing, which is gives it resonance to today in New York, is what, why I wanted to do the piece. This is something that is very common uh, today. And we saw it back then. And these people were not happy about it. Uh, uh, Lizzie herself would be on the cutting edge of what will eventually be the women's right to vote and will be the, the, uh, the feminist movement. Uh, comes out of abolition and temperance, these movements. So abolition has now been resolved. So all they've got left is temperance. Uh, which is which is what she's part of the Women's Christians Temperance Union uh, WCTU, um, so she does that and and her affiliation with the church. So there's multiple churches in town because now you've got Methodists, you've got Protestants, you've got Catholics, uh, you've got Irish, uh, you've got a couple. I haven't heard any Jews in this story, but I'm sure they did something yet. wrong. Yet we haven't heard that. He's yet. a banker. He had to know. Him. But he didn't. <laughs> he, it didn't God, it's not in any of the books. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so. The woman who is the maid, uh, Maggie, a.k.a. Bridget Sullivan, gets the giant ladder, begins to get her bucket, and she has this mop with an extension on it, and she has to go out to the barn to get the water. It's a federal production. Uh, meanwhile, she's outside, so, so what does she do? She goes over to the fence, and as things will have it, she talks to another maid for an hour. You know, who's next door? Because she really doesn't want to do this. Uh, so she's just talking to her friend who's the maid, of the next door house over the fence. So she's talking to her maybe 20 minutes. I'm not really sure the length of, of conversation with her. So meanwhile, upstairs where the stepmom is changing the, the uh, bedding uh, of that bed that John Morse was in, there's the two men have left. The father's gone, John Morse is gone, Bridget is outside uh, and, and, and Emma has gone to the next town the only two people in that house at this time, as far as we know, are Lizzie Borden and Abby Borden. That's it. And somehow one of them ends up dead. And this is the actual photo. This is right next to the bed. Uh, and, and by the way, this is a bed and breakfast now. You could stay in that room. Oh, uh, yes. And they have props for you if you wanted to okay. rehearse. Yeah, you could. This is OK. This is the shot. The other shot. Uh, that's the bed on the right. There's a, there's her cabinet on the left there of the, of the guest room, which was pretty big. The guest room was actually bigger than Emma's bedroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so she took about 20 whacks to the head, right, Eric? She 19. 19 whacks to the head. Now, keep in mind, the axe, if it is an axe, and I have my doubts whether it was an axe, because people always say it's an axe, but there may be some other murder weapons here. She gets hit from behind. The first shot probably killed her. Um, this is uh, an axe handle, axe head that was found by the Fall River Police. They found about four axes, by the way, 
uh, down in the basement. And not anything unusual, but especially with Uncle John. Well, pe- but I'm saying people chopped wood a lot back then, and they and they also chopped up pigeons. Mm-hmm. They chopped up uh, 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 stuff. There was a, a one of that particular axe handle that you were showing was sent to Harvard University, uh, where a blood expert said that that was hair and blood from a cow that they had slaughtered. So that entire piece of evidence went out the window uh, because that they thought was the murder weapon was not the murder weapon. And it's That's, really more of a hatchet than an axe, but. I meant to say hatchet. I meant to no, say hatchet. No, 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 but the, the yeah. poem is axe and people oh, say yeah, axe. It's not but, an axe. It's not, an axe. It's not only a, a matter of a, a tool for butchering, but that's also a hammer. Right. Now and they you're pulling nails and everything. So they felt uh, that the handle was broken off and burned because you can't get blood off the handle. You can wipe the blood and wash it right off of that blade and never to be seen again. But with the handle, this is what the police said. Uh, it would saturate it with blood and you can't get it off. Okay. So they believe that whoever did this broke that handle off and burned it in the stove. Just so you know, it's an interesting uh, tidbit. Uh, now, have you, have you ever dealt with hammers? You, you know how hard it is to break a freaking handle on a hammer. I mean, it can well, happen. Well, well, with well, this, is a tom- this is a hatchet. First of all, it's not well, a but hammer. it's a similar, but, it, but the handle is very similar in thickness. So can you keep that in okay. mind when you're talking about the timing? Uh-oh saying is they all claimed there was a fresh break how mm-hmm. i how they did it i have no idea mm-hmm. and all the authorities claimed that that break was fresh on yeah. that and you can tell by the wood okay the mm-hmm. handle had no blo- had no uh, human blood on it and but that could easily have been washed off now they will find tinsel inside the brain skull of abby borden when I say tinsel, there's another word for it, like tinkle or something. And it is the shiny metal that goes on the blade. Uh, this is the head of Abby Borden. This will be brought into the courtroom. This is from the axe or whatever it was, tomahawk, figure it out. Inside there was a piece of metal that was connected to the shiny metal that went onto the blade when you bought it in a hardware store. That was inside the skull. Go figure that, which means it may have been brand new. Could be. Okay. How do you like that? I don't know. The whole case is a mess. No, no. Okay. <laughs> it's not even a mess yet. It's not even a mess yet. Because there's no it's somebody case. after my spirit. Make it move, Eric. Make it move. <laughs> We're laughing at mass murder. That's how low we've gone. I mean, there's going to be people in the comments. Oh, it's going to be great. Oh, it's going to be great. How dare you laugh at mass murder? How dare you? Uh, Too soon? Uh, Too soon? (laughs) Really? It's It's only been 130 years, Mark. We need another 50. Not enough for me and the Christian (laughs) Temperance Union. Uh, Anyway, so the the woman is, is hacked repeatedly in the skull 20 times and 19 or 20 times, whatever the hell it was. And, and it has to be a crime of passion, as you're well aware, Eric, having studied this, because if you're knifing, stabbing, chopping face to face multiple times, that is usually it's someone personal. Who, it is personal. This is personal. Uh, who's ever doing this? Because lo- many times these crimes and these criminals, and this goes back to the Menendez brothers. This goes back to my old friend uh, 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 DeFeo in Amityville. Somebody broke in and killed my parents. How many times have you heard that? This is a constant theme in American jurisprudence and murder cases. Somebody broke in. I don't know who they were. Patrick usually, Sun. yeah, Sorry usually it. could be Negroes. It could be uh, crazy people. We don't know. Could be the Manson people. That was common. Um, mm-hmm. Hippies was common. That was a good one in the '60s. She says the same thing. Uh, somebody broke in and killed my father, which is going to happen in a second. And she doesn't know about that, but we're going to get to that in a second. She lays up there, dead, for an hour and a half on the side of that bed. Nobody knows where she is. Why? Because Lizzie says she got a note from someone to go visit a sick friend and says to the neighbor and later her sister uh, that Abby got a note delivered, delivered, and left. Okay. There was no note ever found. But we're going to get into the note because a note was found. And what happened to that note is subject to a lot of debate right now. Um, 
I'll get into it in a couple of minutes. Abby says, uh, uh, Lizzie says that Abby got a note from a sick, to go see a sick friend. Okay, she doesn't have any friends. She never leaves the house. She has to have a carriage. She's 230 pounds. She ain't going anywhere. She's upstairs laying there dead. Now, what happens after that? The only two people in the house are Lizzie Borden and the dead Abby Borden. Okay, so where is Bridget? Bridget comes back in the house and she says, uh, what's going on? She says, nothing. I was out at the, in the barn and blah, blah, blah. She's still out there cleaning the window. She goes out and gets more water. This window job is like one of the biggest jobs in the history of the house, you know, given to her that day. Uh, I believe it was given to her possibly by Lizzie because Abby never did that before. Uh, so I don't believe and we'll never know because she was killed. So there was never... Sure any way we could know who assigned Bridget that job, except mm -hmm. Bridget saying it, and uh, even that is suspect. So, okay, the father is supposed to come back much later. He usually comes back around dinner time from these things that he went out for. He comes back at around 11 a.m., and he goes to the front door, and the front door has a million bolts on it from the inside bolted. He can't get into his own house. So he's banging on the door, yelling now because he's pissed off that he can't get into his own house. So Bridget comes down and Bridget can't open the door. Why? Because the heat has made the bolt and the wood mm. stick. And there's three of these bolts because somebody locked that door to make sure they weren't discovered when they were killing the stepmom, Abby, uh, uh, up in the bedroom. Okay. So... Bridget is down there trying to open the door and eventually she opens it. And as she goes to open it, she says, ah, fuck it. And she, in court, she says, ah, pshaw. But the, the jury knew <laughs> what she meant. And up on top of the stairs, when she says, fuck it, is Lizzie. And Lizzie lets out a laugh, not because of the murder. She's right up there, right around the bend, right there. Now, if her father, who's at the door, comes in and goes up that stairs, he's going to find his dead wife. So Lizzie is standing right there laughing, not laughing maniacally. I think she was just laughing at the particular problem that Bridget had encountered trying to open the door for the dad who's yelling to be let in. OK, the dad comes in. He says, where's my wife? And Bridget says, I don't know. Lizzie said she went out, got a note that it was a sick friend and she had to go. And, he, and she comes down and tells her dad this too, Lizzie. Lizzie comes down and on the left is the sitting room. And she says, you must be tired. Why don't you take a nap? Why don't you lie down on the couch? And she says she took off his shoes. Uh, but when they find the body, he still has his shoes on, which is not, very, uh, not a very good thing to have. The boots are still on his feet. And she claims that she took his boots off him to help him lie down and sleep and put his slippers on. Turns out that uh, that never happened. This is the room. On the left is the couch. This is the sitting room in the house. Uh, that's one of the lamps. This is like horsehair furniture from the before the Civil War. Uh, this is really old, not fashionable furniture for that town, of that money, in that time. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this was what was in that living room. And on that couch on the left, he lies down and uh, he says, I'm going to read the paper. Now, in his hand is either the paper or some papers or a lock that he found in the street that he picked up as a as a uh, cheap man. He found an old lock in the street. He picked it up. The papers may or may not have been his will. They may or may not have been the deed to the farm for for uh, Uncle John Morris, who's coming back. Uh, it may or may not be the deed for the house that he is, wants to give to his wife uh, for her sister. But whatever it is, those papers disappear from his hands. He lays down to read the Providence uh, uh, newspaper and he, 1130-ish, falls asleep. Okay? Which is not good. Because somebody comes up behind him while he's asleep and hits him in the head with an axe in his face in his eye, in his jaw, in his head, like 11 times, Eric, um, over and over and over again. Same weapon? We don't know. We don't know if it's the same weapon. Uh, we don't know what happens to the first weapon. But his face is made into mincemeat, completely destroyed. When the cops show up, 
the cops are throwing up. I mean, it really is an ugly scene. She is out in the, here's the, the Lizzie explanation. I was out in the barn. Uh, she also said she was in the other room ironing handkerchiefs. She also says she was upstairs in her room. She gives multiple, multiple storylines as to her presence. But the one that sticks, is, she, which is completely insane, is she's out in the barn looking for lead sinkers. And, the, and, and they go, what? <laughs> they go, yeah, I was planning. I Can swear to God. Pitching. No, no. <laughs> I was planning to go on a fishing trip in a few weeks with my sister. So I went out to the barn to find lead sinkers. That story stood until she changed it to, I went out to the barn looking for a piece of metal to fix the hook on my door uh, so it latched. That was the other story. So she changes her story multiple times, Lizzie. She says she's out in the barn in the loft for over 20 minutes when the incident happens. First, she says she hears a thud. Uh, then she claims she never heard a thud. She's out in the, in the yard eating uh, not one, not two, but three pears from that pear tree. If you show that house again, Eric, you'll see um, on the in the yard, there's on the left is a tree um, in front of the barn. Uh, I don't know if, you I don't know really if we see can it. see it, though. Yeah, but there was a little pear tree there. She ate, she claimed to have eaten three pears. So one of the cops goes yeah, into that. OK, you see that you see the window on the second floor of the barn. That's a loft, a full standing loft in that barn. It's really the carriage, horse carriage. It's like a two car garage. That's how big it is. And in that second floor loft is where she says she was during the killings. And 20 minutes, she sticks to it. 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Now, keep in mind, the body upstairs is already rigor mortis is set in on the mother upstairs. The father uh, is downstairs hemorrhaging blood. And um, she comes into the house or is in the house. And she yells out to Bridget, Bridget, come quick. Father has been murdered. Somebody has broken into the house and killed him. That's one sentence. That's one sentence as she's yelling this out. She has solved the crime in one screaming sentence to the maid uh, who comes in. And of course, the maid's completely horrified. Uh, they call for Alice to come over. Of course, you got to call Alice uh, who comes over. Now, a rational person would perceive this crime to be live that there would be a murderer, ax murderer in the house. The guy, literally, it just happens. It's a big house. She's on the first floor with the dead body of her father that's oozing blood. And this is the father's uh, eye. You see the occipital lobe, uh, the ax mark or whatever it is over the, the eye there. You'll see that was the first chop, according to the uh, forensic people. But you can see the damage with the skull, I mean. <laughs> with that, that uh, that's underneath, so it was pretty bad. It, yeah, it, he 11, wasn't going to get back up. Eleven blows in his sleep, um, and when they show up, he's wearing his boots, uh, which you may see in that photo or not see in that photo. The reality of it is, um, he's got like beetle boots on, something the Beatles wore. Uh, it must have been earlier than the Beatles, because this is like 1892 before the British invasion. But nevertheless, he still has his boots on. She uh, has uh, Bridget run out and says, get a doctor, get a doctor. So she doesn't go across the street because that's an Irish doctor. She doesn't go next door because that's an Irish doctor. She has to run down the street to get Dr. Bowen, Dr. Seabury Bowen, a young, handsome bon vivant. He's married, uh, but he is a young, handsome doctor. And he comes into the house and sees this thing. And he's never seen anything like it in his life. Now, this, this doctor, apparently, this is Seabury uh, Bowen, uh, the, the Protestant doctor uh, with those lamb chops going on there. He will stand around the house, look things over, and begin to at least get a sheet to cover the bodies. He will be seen tearing up a tiny piece of paper that one of the cops sees over his shoulder, says the word Emma, on it he mm. tear oh no no this is unbelievable this is really unbelievable he takes this 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 piece of paper uh which has writing on it one of the cops said that he, he saw the name emma on the top of the paper and he says uh, what are you doing with that and he says well it's a note it's uh, to my daughter about going somewhere or something tears it up into a trillion little pieces and throws it into the fire 
in the stove. I, I swear to God, this is the doctor. This is the doctor. Mm. He tears this. He he feels that he must tear up in a trillion pieces this note that has the sister's name. Oh, who knows what the rest of the note is? Mm -hmm. um, now, keep in mind, somebody came to the door delivering something and had the door slammed in their face at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, some people believe this might have been the, the courier with this note. Uh, and whether it was a real note or a phony note or a note, uh, you know, to get Abby out of the house or whatever. I don't know what this doctor is doing burning this note. Now, once the note is burning in that stove, the cop looks in the stove and in there is burning the other papers of uh, uh, the dead father that he came home with. And, hmm. you know, the paper sometimes could burn slower, you know, because sure. it, it takes a while. And in there, he doesn't pull it out because that's that would be a cop for you. You know, but he these cops, by the way, all of the cops are at their annual picnic uh, outside of Fall River at a lake. The only two cops are the chief of police and his assistant. And they're the two that show up. All these guys are out playing baseball at the lake. And they hear about this uh, and they all come running back to the town. Now, what's outside the town, uh, outside the house? 3,000 people assemble outside that house that you just saw. 3,000 people are assembling outside the house. The bodies, this is the beach where they should have gone. This is the, the, the waterfront in Fall River. I know it doesn't look like Malibu, but nevertheless, it was a good place to go back in the day. So they, they, they all are assembling outside because everybody hears about this. The telegraph is everywhere. The telegraph is now the internet, Eric. The well, telegraph they reported it to the newspaper before the cops. Yeah. I think that might have been the doctor too, or whoever it was. The doctor did it. The doctor's wife. Mm. And it gets to um, gets across the country. It's everywhere. They're actually printing stories before the cops even get there. So they get they take the two body. Wait a second. Let me back up. The father, when he came home, did not go up the stairs. Right. Right. When all these people are downstairs with the father, uh, the doctor says, where's Abby? And, he, and that's where the note comes into play. Uh, how mm. the doctor gets the note. I don't know. But they say, where's Abby? And, and, and Lizzie says she went out for a sick friend. And somebody, then Abby changes, Lizzie changes the story. She says, I thought I heard her come back. Another crock of shit. Because she's obviously been dead for two hours. And the doctor says, well, somebody should go look for her. So Alice and Bridget summon up the courage to go up the stairs and look for Abby. Didn't and Lizzie when, ask them to go? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I, I, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Lizzie was like, Bridget, Bridget. Oh, Bridget. Yeah. Well, Alice goes with her, and they could see on the landing from the stairs under the bed, they see her laying there. You could see it from the stairs. There's a photograph, uh, I don't know if you have it, of her body uh, from through the, the well, thing. That's there. the best I have, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. The point of they go up there and they go, there's another one. And they go, what? They go, yeah. Doctor goes up, sees that she's been dead for two hours. And now we're led to believe that she was killed. This is the, the popular spin. She was killed. The killer hid in the closet for two hours, Which came out. It's No, it's insane. The door's locked from the inside, right? All the doors are locked. The killer hid inside that closet in the, in the guest room, came down when the father was sleeping, and then killed the father, and then escaped in a pool of blood. That's what we're led to believe. Your okay. normal frenzied killer chilling out for about 90 minutes. Perfectly normal, Mark. Well, I'll tell you what's <laughs> also not what's not perfectly normal. She is completely composed, Lizzie. She is spotless in her dress. Her hair is completely spotless. Her hands are completely uh, clean. Her fingernails are spotless. There's not a speck of disarray on her entire person. When the police show up literally five minutes, Eric, to 13 minutes after the murder. So you tell me how this woman hacked these two people to death and does not have a spot of blood on her, nor is there any blood around, nor there uh, is anything that you could connect to her in terms of the murder. So and there was one spot of blood. It was on an inner dress. It wasn't even blood. It turns out to be lamb. It turns out to be the mutton. Was it okay? Yeah, it turned that turned out to be, and 
And her other defense was, which was true, she was menstruating. And hmm. one of the connections to this type of epilepsy in women is menstruation. Apparently, it's brought on, and this has happened previously in her life, uh, it's brought on by menstruation, first with migraines, which they had no treatment for, and then this type of blackout epilepsy. Uh, so she was menstruating, and she said that that blood might have been menstrual blood in her defense. Hmm. Uh, but know. that being said, the idea that she kills her stepmother with an axe, just let, just play this out. This is a small woman, half the size of the woman she's killing, by the way, who has no history of axing people to death, who has no history of doing anything like this, somehow takes an axe or something else, which I'm going to mention in a second, bludgeons her repeatedly over and over and over again, gets no blood on her, somehow maybe changes into another dress. That becomes a bone of contention. And we're going to get into that in a second. Waits, calms down, talks to her maid, is perfectly sane. The father comes home. She does the entire thing again. Within minutes, people are in the house. Again, no blood. Again, her hair is completely pristine. Again, she's spotless. Her face, her makeup, everything is as is for a woman of that gilded era Victorian look. Go mm -hmm. ahead and figure that out, Hunley. I'll wait here. <laughs> That's the problem with the whole thing. The blood has always been a problem. Giant there's, problem. There's blood splattered all over the wall from the father's head. There's blood splattered on the soaking into the carpet upstairs. I mean, gallons of blood from the head because she was already down on the carpet. Lizzie um, is not even in shock. She's not phased. No remorse. No weeping. The police immediately. What? Oh, I was looking at the chat. Even the nude argument doesn't. How'd she get dressed up I, I, within I the five minutes in her dress? You know, first off, how did she wash off without any running water or good running water? Right. Then there's no running get water. Into a dress. Right. Which, and by the way, those were not easy dresses. They were You're like contraptions. Girdles, girdles yeah. brassiers, uh, bustiers, uh, uh, undergarments. The shoes have nothing. The black stockings have nothing. Uh, the hair has nothing. The fingernails, the makeup. Her hands would have been bruised from the yep. savagery of wielding a tomahawk into a woman's skull. Probably when they cut herself because Absolutely. often they get cut Absolutely. when they're in or that bruised. Or bruised. How about bruised? Yeah. You know, just from the savagery of taking a hammer or an axe or a tomahawk and doing it. Now, there is a photo of the stove. I don't know if you can see this photo. I, I sent you a photo of the stove. Uh, don't you could find that. Look. Okay. If, if you get a lot, you can't animate the stove. So I, I'm not going to be horrified. But the stove is where they made the Johnny Cakes that morning. The Johnny Cakes is like a, I, I don't know, some of you people down pancake. south. Maine. But it's like a cornmeal pancake. Right, Eric? Right, right. right. It's a variant, yeah. Okay, so in the morning, Bridget makes cookies. She makes these Johnny Cakes. She makes coffee. You got to get the stove going early. And later on, Liz, uh, Lizzie will be ironing handkerchiefs, which I guess everybody does back then uh, as part of her. Uh, she did a lot of housework, as did the stepmom, as did the sister. So she's in the next room. Uh, at one point in the story, when she's not in the barn, she claims to be ironing handkerchiefs. Now, the, the reason I wanted to show this stove is because of what's sitting on the stove. And this is one of my theories. But on top of the stove are the irons. These are called sad irons. It's, I think there's three or four of them on top of the stove. And these would heat up and you would then iron, right? Sure. The iron itself has a triangular wedge type of, of device, uh, uh, angle to it. If you look at the irons, they're almost triangles, Eric. If you, you can mm -hmm. imagine an iron. Uh, these are non-electric, so it has a handle on the top that's really hard. It's a wooden handle with some steel attached to the iron so the heat doesn't go through it. And if you pick up that iron, I believe that was the murder weapon, not an axe, not a hatchet. I believe it was the, these irons that are on the stove. It's the same shape. It's a triangular steel metal iron uh, 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 thing that has an incredible blunt force. And I think that's what she used was the irons. And they're looking around for axes. I think she just washed off uh, or wiped off the blood on those irons and put it back on top of the stove. 
The stove has a lot of involvement in this storyline. The next day, uh, two days after the murder, she will take her blue dress that she wore that day that she claims has paint on it, and she will burn it in the stove in front of her sister and in front of uh, Alice, her girlfriend. And Alice says to her, you shouldn't burn that uh, 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 dress. They want it for evidence. It was already being requested for evidence, and she burns it right in that stove. And later on, they tell the police that she burned the evidence of the dress she wore that day. And Alice will testify in the case as to what I just said. And because of that, Lizzie will never speak to her again because she testified truthfully what happened with that dress. Now, the blue dress, they do a lot of chicanery about that blue dress. And it is burnt up by her. Uh, that is part of her uh, guilt is burning up that blue dress. And Alice Russell will testify in open court that the blue dress was burnt up in that stove, along with the note. And I think that this was an iron that killed her and not an ax. I believe it was those irons. And let me see if I can maybe get this here. I'll show you. Yeah, I'm finding the stove right now. Uh, yeah, but while you're finding it, let me show you a picture of the stove. If you look at the irons, uh, that's okay. what I'm talking about, Eric. There it is. I believe one of those four irons was the murder weapon, or even two of them. I don't even think she cared when she went for the father. I believe that that was the murder weapon right there that you're looking at on that stove. Everything on that involved with this stove is involved in this murder. Uh, the dress is burned. Now, look at the father's shoes. She claims that he she put his slippers on. There are his boots after his demise, still wearing them. So she lied about that. Um, she lied about the dress. But again, as many people point out, that doesn't mean she did it. That doesn't mean she... Oh, there it is. Okay, so you got the one with the stove. You got the axe handle. You got the thing. Um, they put out... I don't know if you have a picture of this. The sisters put out a $5,000 reward. They also put out a $50 reward, or maybe a $500 reward, for the messenger that delivered the note. No messenger is ever found for the $500. They put out a $5,000 reward, the sisters, for any information regarding the murder of their father and stepmom. Uh, there's a wanted poster that's um, by Andrew Borden and wife, arrest and conviction. Okay, so there is a guy, they have a family attorney uh, who's been on retainer for years. He shows up and says, you know, I am your father's attorney. I've been on retainer for years. He, I'm, I'm more than willing to help you. Uh, I'm a criminal attorney. I've helped your dad in the past. I could be your attorney, and we'll see what happens. This guy, right? Andrew Jackson Jennings? That's the family attorney. Yeah, that's the guy. He shows up, and and but before he shows up, the chief of police shows up, and uh, his second in command shows up, the mayor shows up, and they say to her that you're the lead suspect in this thing. And she, and she goes, what? How can I be the lead suspect? I, I was out in the barn, and they said, well, we're sorry. Um, your story doesn't work. It's like Joe Pesci and JFK. And we're going to have to hold you over. <laughs> what part of the story didn't you like, Mr. Mr. Garrison? Uh, the whole thing doesn't work. Um, Anyway, so there's a guy named George Dexter Robinson. Now, George Dexter Robinson is famous in the state of Massachusetts. He becomes the main attorney for her. Now, let me, before we get to the case itself, she, oh, Jesus, that's kind of freaky. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So this is George. Hi, Dexter. George. Hi, George. Don't even say anything, George. She is brought to New Bedford, to a women's prison there in New Bedford, Massachusetts, because there's no facility in Fall River. And she's put into the jail there in uh, Fall River. They bring in a rug later. They bring in a bed. They bring in restaurant. No, I swear to God. They bring in restaurant food. She gains 45 pounds before the trial starts. But because she's in there from like September, October, November, December, January, she's indicted. OK, it, there's an inquest. Uh, with a, they bring her in for the inquest, and in the inquest uh, is this guy. Um, her attorney is told to stand outside. That's Andrew Jackson Jenkins. This guy's not involved yet. Robinson uh, Jenkins is told to stand out. Um, Jennings is told to stand outside, and the judge, that guy, uh, is told to stand outside. He, he can't. Oh, that's that's Robinson. 
He's not involved yet. No, this is Jennings. At, this is Jennings. Okay, Jennings is told to stand outside. Yes. <laughs> he is not allowed into the inquest. And under Commonwealth law, apparently that's kosher. She's not guaranteed to have representation or an attorney at this particular private inquest, right? So in the inquest, uh, it's determined that she's going to be possibly guilty. And but the judge in the case at the end says, I'm going to hold this over for the grand jury because you're probably guilty. He says this in, in the inquest out loud. It's in the transcripts. Mm -hmm. He says, you're probably guilty. So we're going to hold it over. It goes to a grand jury. Uh, that doesn't happen until November of that year, Eric. So I think still... she was also being treated by a doctor at the time with morphine. Okay, now I'm going to get into this doctor because this is Dr. Bowen. Dr. Bowen, that day in the house, injects her with two grains of morphine. Now, one grain is the normal dosage. He injects her with two grains of morphine to make her more comfortable. He will inject her with two grains of morphine up until and through every day from the day of the murder through the trial. Think about mm. that's a year away. That's a year away. She's not going to go to trial till June of the next year. Every day, this guy Bowen is there with that huge metal syringe. Every day with two grains of morphine, not one, injecting her. Okay, Bowen is a freak. Bowen's got something to do with this, and we're going to get into how Bowen is involved in this. And uh, this is really crazy. But she is at the inquest. They said we're going to have to go to the grand jury. So in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it now goes to the grand jury. The grand jury is being run by a guy named Hosea Knowlton. Hosea, Hosea Knowlton, who is the prosecutor in the case, will later become the attorney general of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, here he is. Oh, no, Blinky, don't do it. No, stop it. This He's very guy, dignified. Very, he was very dignified. And in fact, he was revered as a prosecutor. And he looked at this as a slam dunk case. He had every single thing except a murder weapon, except a confession, except blood. Uh, but other than that, he had every single thing. There was nobody else who could have done it except her. But apparently under Massachusetts law, that doesn't cut it. You can't just be the only one who had to do it. Uh, as a, a non-legal speech, uh, whatever that means in legal terms. You can't just be the one who's locked in a box with someone and kills them. You have to prove it, if that makes any sense, because essentially she's locked in a box with yeah. the two. Right, Eric, right? Yeah, I mean, well, that, it, that's the problem is you have the, the means, the motive, the opportunity, but mm -hmm. you got to actually get that final nexus of which yeah i saw her do it or yeah right. there's this blood on her or yeah there's this and they didn't have any of that which right. is the worst they had they everything. had her contradictions they had her stepping on her own lies they had her you know doing stuff to herself and we're going to get into that <clears throat> but right now hosea Knowlton, who is the prosecutor goes before the grand jury the grand jury votes is 21 people on the grand jury 20 vote to uh, she's guilty uh, 20 out of 21 vote to go to trial, whatever that means in terms of the actual affirmation of what the 21, uh, 20 out of 21 did or 21 out of 22. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a slam dunk. So the trial becomes a trial of the century. Uh, there's 300 telegraph lines that are installed at the courthouse. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's just it, people are living there. They're buying property. They're moving in. OK, so get just getting back to the day of the murder, just to go into another suspect. This guy, Uncle John, comes back from his trip to the farm and he takes the uh, 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 train trolley and he gets to the house. There's three. Oh, boy. Oh, no, Eric. Oh, he's a freak. This is the butcher. He, he comes back and he doesn't go in the house. He doesn't know what's going on. There's a mob outside. He goes into the yard and he eats three pears off that tree. He goes in the yard. He doesn't talk to any of the cops. The cops who are through the house now are looking out the window. And we know what I just said is true because the cops testified that that's what he did. This guy comes back. They go, look, in the yard, a strange man. And, and, and he's eating three pears, right? <laughs> then he comes in and he says, I am the brother-in-law of the deceased. And, I, and they said, really? Like, maybe you did it. And he goes, no, 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 no. 
I couldn't have done it because I have an ironclad alibi. And he goes in to describe his alibi in such detail that every single cop thinks he made it up. But that it's factual, but that he literally is the guy that did it because the alibi is so into the weeds and minutia. He talks about being on the trolley with seven priests. He talks about the badge number of a cop that he happened to record. Dude, it's insane. The he, alibi he was General Walker saying, I am on this plane. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely true. So the cops go, dude, this guy's got to be in on it. He's a butcher. He's got He's got meat cleavers in a bag. I mean, he's in some business deal with the father that may or may not have gone bad. We don't know, but he's a suspect. In fact, later that day, same day, almost at five o'clock, he says, you know what? I got to go to the post office. I got to mail these letters. It's been bothering me all day, boys. I'm going to take a walk over to the post office. He goes out the door with a mail in his hand and he starts walking to the post office and there's 3000 people outside and they go, look, he's the one who did it. Get him. And they grab the guy and they're dragging him to lynch him from a tree. And the police have to rush out and save this suspect from being lynched by the town's people of Fall River. Okay. He's extricated, and now he's given a bodyguard. His alibi uh, and the indictment of, of Lizzie Borden drop him from the entire spectrum of suspects. He's literally off the earth because of his unbelievable alibi of being with his cousin when he got to the farm and the priests on the train and the badge number of the cop and blah, blah, blah. However... Uh, we don't know what this guy was into. We don't know what he was up to. And he is completely off the radar now by the cops because they now believe, and not crazily, that Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her parents 40 wax, uh, or close to it combined, maybe 31 or 32. But nevertheless, as this is really weird, as they're assembling a jury in the case, now she's been incarceration, incarcerated for 11 months, 10 months. She's living pretty large in the jail cell. They brought in rugs. She's got a, a furniture in there, Eric. She's got furniture, you know, and she's writing in her journal. She gets her lawyers to visit her. She picks up this guy, George Dexter Robinson, the former governor of, of, of Massachusetts, uh, who was appointed one of the judges in the case. If you think that's not a conflict of interest, he appointed one of the judges seven years before in the case that he's in. Uh, nobody found this to be unusual. Anyway, there's reporters up the kazoo. She's incarcerated. What happens? What happens that night? Right when the jury's being assembled, an ax murder. Somebody breaks into a house, kills a woman in Fall River with an ax to the head, Hunley, chopping her repeatedly over and over and over again. And the jury goes in to be sequestered with only the knowledge of what I just told you. <laughs> because the crime will not be solved until they're sequestered from media. And it turns out to be an illegal Portuguese immigrant who's mm. robbing and chops her in the head with a hatchet killing her. And the mm. twist is he'd only been in the country for 60 days, so he couldn't have done the murders. But the fact is a Portuguese, Portuguese immigrant who was suspected originally, not him personally, but that was the original idea. Here is the same situation actually happening in the same town in the same year. Go figure that one out. Now, they got the guy, but it goes to the point that the people do break in and kill people, especially in this sure. town, with a hatchet. With a hatchet. I don't even know what's going on there. And then you can add to the jury because um, there was actually advancements in jurisprudence at the time. Mm -hmm. And there are questions about her being uh, inquested under the influence of heroin without okay. an attorney yes. and that yes. got taken off so that this jury did not see the, the, the inquest, contradictions right the inquest is denied is denied uh to be admitted as evidence into the case by the judge that was appointed by robinson to the bench he denies the the admission of the inquest testimony by her uh which is damning as all f and i'll tell you something else the judge denies you know what he denies 
Remember the guy, Eli Bentz, who had his eyes moving around in your AI? That sketchy pharmacist? Mm -hmm. Denies the admission of his testimony of buying the Prusik acid. Even he can't believe it. The judge says it has nothing to do with the case and was way out of the calendar uh, range of the murder. It was two days before the murder. <laughs> the judge rules it was way out of line. Latches okay? or standing? No, sorry. <laughs> it was both latches and standing. So this guy, Hosea Knowlton, is ripping his hair out, the, the prosecutor, because he believes he's got a slam dunk case. Uh, outside the courthouse are hundreds and hundreds of feminist women protesting that she's being charged with murder but and being judged by an all-male bearded white jury in suits. So you've got that going on with signs, kind of like this trial that I was looking at on court TV where the woman may have murdered the cop and her husband was a cop, her boyfriend was a cop and ran him over with the car. There's oh, people oh, that's a whole big case. Yeah, Turtle Boy. Yeah, Turtle Boy case where the people are outside protesting. That's what the courthouse looked in, like in New Bedford or, or where they had the case. So she's going in there every day being brought in from the uh, jail. She's impeccably dressed. She doesn't bat an eye. And the, as the opening arguments for the trial begin, uh, Knowlton's assistant, the assistant DA, stands up and holds up a dress uh, that he believes is the dress that was worn or a dress that looked like the dress that was worn. And as he holds up the dress, he knocks over a box onto the table. And in that box are the two skulls of her dead parents. And mm. she collapses to the floor and faints right in the courtroom and everybody screams. And there's some drama right on day one in the opening statement, Eric. Now, how did those heads get in there? Once they buried her father and stepmom, hey, yeah, this is crazy. The, the DA orders the heads to be chopped off and taken to Harvard and have the flesh and hair boiled off, which is, of course, what you do, uh, and to examine the skulls and brought in for evidence eventually. Uh, but they literally dug up the bodies as they were being put into the ground and chopped the heads off and put them back into the ground. So there's headless bodies in those graves. Right. Well, they put their heads by the feet, I think. Well, oh, he didn't, he that's didn't terrible. That's no, they terrible. did, but he didn't. Yeah. I, I'm guessing he didn't try to save money. Oh, wait. He, no, no. no but they, <laughs> she, I mean, to go into that courtroom on day one and see the head of your dad uh, on the table, the skull. and the head, Oh, that it, helped her. It helped her immensely, though, because oh. it showed her delicate nature yeah. that this poor, delicate woman, there's no way she could do it. I mean, look, when she saw the skull, she click went right out as a proper delegate well, right oh she wasn't faking it she wasn't faking it um uh, you know she 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 blacked out and and the and the courtroom went went flipped out uh, that might be an artist's conception of it from uh frank leslie's illustrated i think yeah um, it's just uh, the courtroom but not necessarily the uh skull right but, right well there's a photo of the jury itself there is photos of the jury for some reason they must have posed for it afterwards for uh... anyway the judge name yeah. well, the judge name was uh justin dewey uh he was the judge who was appointed by the governor this is uh, the jury oh there's a jury okay great yeah they look like righteous dudes uh cool. it looks like Dub abner doubleday's uh white Sox from 1919 um, yeah, so this is the jury. And I'll tell you something, the feminists had nothing to worry about because uh, it's going to turn out that they literally, when they when were sequestered, decided the case in five minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. when, they, when, jury, when the jury uh, deliberation it took them five minutes, they stayed in there by their own admission for an hour and a half to make it look good. They, they said this. They mm -hmm. said this mm -hmm. to make it look good. They were, they were done in five minutes uh, acquitting her of all charges. And they were celebrated, too. I mean, that's why they, they, they're posing. I mean, there were articles written about how they showed class and, yeah. you know, came up and they, you know, erased this embarrassment to the society. Because at that time, it was very popular decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very well, popular. Well, two out of the three judges, on, there was a three-judge panel, by the way, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for a capital murder. Uh, it's not now, but up until... Dude, there wasn't a female juror in the state of Massachusetts until 1951. 1951, yeah. right? But yeah, these three, the three-judge panel, two of the judges broke down crying. That shows you how strong these guys were. Two of them broke down crying. 
I mean, she gets acquitted. You know, it's not like she's going to the death penalty. So she collapses, you know, with joy. And uh, and then she decides to go directly to Newport, uh, which is what most people do instead of going to Disney World. She goes directly to Newport and parties for a week and um, never goes back to the house, the murder house. Um, she then, with the money, she gets uh, $7.5 million. Her sister gets the other $7.5 million in probate. There's no will. There's nothing left. Their fear was the money would be left to Abby. The, the, the reason it was important that Abby died first was, mm -hmm. <laughs> was to make sure that she didn't get them. Her family did not get the money. Right, right. because if, yes, if dad yes. died first, it would be Abby. And if Abby, Abby died after, could have been her siblings. Could yes. Have been some oh, other people. oh, yes. Yeah, so. Oh, yes. So everybody kind of realizes in the town of Fall River, she tries to come back to church. She tries to come back into society. She is shunned physically when she shows up at the church where she was the school teacher, uh, the, the Sunday school teacher. She, they literally physically move away from her. Everyone in the town knows she did it. Everyone of, of society. But not right away. It, it took no. a couple of years. And that's the weird part is because I believe she got estranged with, with her sister around the same time. That well, that's 1905. Years. That's 1905. That's pretty far but, down the line, but they move into Maplecroft. Now, show a picture of Maplecroft. Show this house. It's a dump. They, this I'm incredible just... dump, Maplecroft, which is up on the hill. She it stays in Fall River. She never leaves the town of her birth. She goes to Newport for a week to party like it's 1899, uh, to quote Prince. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> the inside of the house, if you could show some of the pictures, the inside of this house, I don't know if you, if you saw some I sent you. Um, um, yeah, I've got the interior. And, and by the okay. way, I have, a, I have a theory about this. Um, Leslie and I are into antiquing or whatever. We jo I made the joke that Victorians didn't have TV, so that's why they have such busy wallpaper. And so they have something to look at. Because, I mean, if you look at this house, there's something moving on every surface. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no, no. I, they, were the very they were very cluttered. Back yeah, then. see that? Uh, yeah, that. I mean, of that time, no, it's just every pattern on pattern on pattern on. That's amazing. It really is amazing. Uh, but this is some house. Look at the kitchen. I mean, it is unbelievable. Uh, the the beauty inside this estate. Four uh, bathrooms, Mark. Yeah, she wasn't my... taking any chances. <laughs> <laughs> she had to take a dump on the second floor. She was going to go on the second floor. Now, now she begins. I just this is a like part three. This is like Act Three of the story. Uh, we get to Act Three now. She begins to have a new life. She lives there with her sister and begins to party like it's 1899. Like I said, she begins to roll with the theater crowd out of New York, and she hooks up with a chick named Nance O'Neill. Nance O'Neill is the Meryl Streep of American theater. She. This is Nance O'Neill. She is, oh, Jesus, you're creeping me out. Huh? <laughs> oh, no, Hunley, you got to stop. You got to stop. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I'll counter with this. Oh, okay. Nance O'Neill <laughs> is the Meryl Streep of stage. She's the uh, Sarah Bernhardt, uh, the American Sarah Bernhardt, according to the New York Times. She moves into silent films, uh, then moves into Hollywood films. There's a bunch of them. Uh, I was I sent you one yesterday uh, where she's in a a, a, a talking in up in 1931. Uh, yes, I, I found an even better clip. Um, I'll okay, try to show both right. of those. But anyway, this okay. is her. Oh no, she was and huge. She was huge. No, they, a huge star, movie star, movie huge star, huge star of the mega proportions. So she begins to to go to New York and to hang out with her. Uh, this is the potential lesbian relationship that I had implied, but there are others. Uh, there's love letters between the two, which I've yet to get my hands on, that are apparently hotter than Ruth Payne's and, uh, and <laughs> Marina Oswald's, uh, according to sources. Uh, there's love letters between the two of them. Now, that being said, 1905, uh, Emma has had enough. And after one massive party in that house, again, with Nance O'Neill after some theater production, uh, she moves out. And she never speaks to her sister again. And people believe it's one of two things. Either uh, Lizzie told her the entire plot to her sister for the first and entire time, or 
she had developed an intense lesbian relationship with uh, Nance O'Neill and her sister wasn't having it, moved out either way, never spoke to her again uh, for the rest of her life. Uh, which So something happened in 1905 in that house. Uh, uh, the partying was definitely going on. The celebrating was going on. Uh, the Nance O'Neill relationship was quite real. Now, let's get into uh, Bridget Sullivan, uh, the Irish maid. Now, in the movie with uh, uh, Chris, uh, with Kristen, uh, uh, what's her face, and and, and Kristen Stewart, who is a lesbian, by the way, and uh, um, uh, what's her name, the um, the one who was in Buffalo '66, there is a lesbian relationship in that movie depicted, and it has been depicted in books, um, <laughs> and it has been depicted in stage plays. So it's not just some harebrained idea. I finally got um, Nance pulled up. If, oh, know, yeah. Let me see that. I, yeah, let's see that. This is different footage than you had. Oh, oh small, okay. Yeah. All right. Robert, I want to talk to you. Oh? I want to talk to you pretty seriously. There's something extremely suspicious going on in this household, and you ought to know about it. That's very interesting. It's safe. It's plain to be seen that you and Elsie are no more than friends. Certainly, she's Whoa. not wife to you. I won't say that she's deceiving you. No, Nora, I shouldn't say that. But I do say that ever since she came back from Paris, there's been something strange about her. Now, this is about 30 years after she had a relationship with Liz. It's like 1931, so right. 25 years or so um, to get an idea. So she, she was a little older in this role, and also when you said where she played the queen, but um, you know, yeah, she was right. But, but she 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 was a, she she was a professional stage actress who had incredible reviews, even and then reviews in in silent films. Oh, uh, movie star and, star. I mean, a movie star like, star. But started out as a mm -hmm. star of Broadway. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, the the attorney in the case, and this is where it gets interesting. The attorney in the case uh, who be, who was the governor. This guy, uh, uh, George Robinson, it turns out that the the documents from the case right to this day, George Dexter Robinson, are still sealed uh, by the law firm. And the experts believe that in there, I don't even know how to tell you this. He was paid five hundred thousand dollars for the case. Literally or today's dollar? Twenty five thousand okay. uh, dollars. Five hundred thousand by today's standards, by today's okay. numbers. It's paid twenty five thousand dollars. And in that money was money to bribe and and suborn perjury from all these different witnesses. And one of them was Bridget Sullivan, who was sent back to Ireland. She was paid. Uh, it's all in those documents, which they will never release. And people have tried to get court orders. They've tried everything to get the court documents and his internal notes. And his, and they keep citing a, a client attorney privilege 130 years, 150 years after the death of both of them. It's preposterous. And most experts believe that he spread money around. There's an ice cream vendor who claims that he saw her coming out of the barn. He was paid. Bridget Sullivan was paid. The woman who wasn't paid was the one who said, I don't give a shit. I told her not to burn that dress, and I'm going to testify in court that she burned that dress. That chick didn't take the money. The doctor who burned that note took the money. That's why I mentioned Seabury uh, Bowen, because that piece of shit who was injecting her with morphine every single day uh, burned up the note in that stove, and he was paid, I believe. This guy with the $500,000... Um, spread that money around. And she really bought her way uh, to innocence, Eric, to an acquittal. Uh, having possible. The, uh, yeah, also, uh, keep yeah, in I, mind that there was no income tax. So well, that, cash, that's, no, no, no. Cash could work really well. It's very easy to hide cash back then. Okay. Well, Especially well, if you leave I, the I country. I don't know if they were hiding it, but he was billing them. It was pretty above board. The billing No, no, no. Who else. he paid off. Oh, no, like, absolutely. Like Bridget absolutely. could absolutely. get cash, go to Ireland. Would you know? No. No. Mm -hmm. In exactly. fact, in fact, I think she was having a lesbian relationship with Bridget as well. Uh, but I think Bridget was paid off because the absurdity of it uh, is that Bridget must have either washed her off in both movies. Uh, she does the killings naked. 
Uh, Bridget might have helped her with the killings, and I believe John Morris was also involved. John Morris, I think, was uh, given part of the estate by uh, Lizzie. I don't know how much money he was given. It was also in cash. He disappears off the face of the earth uh, with his take on it. I think Morse was involved. I think it was multiple people involved. And that's why Lizzie walks is because mm -hmm. none of the logic that you and I are talking about can hold up for a court case. None. Of, you know, the fact that all this stuff happens, it's because it's not one person. It's three people, possibly Even two killers. Even two killers, possibly four people involved in this case. And that's why, really, at the end of the day, it was never solved. Because she either paid them to do it, oversaw them doing it, was involved in them doing it. But I can tell you right now, she did not do this alone. There is no way on the face of the earth that this chick took an axe and killed both those people without any blood on her and got away with it uh, um, without anybody seeing her. Yeah. And uh, also keep in mind, he just happened, you know, uncle happened to be there. This is her mother's brother, not mm -hmm. her father's brother, mm -hmm. which does make a difference. Uh, Emma, because he would have been cut out of the will too, by the way. Yeah. Potentially. Um, there's also the question about if Emma even could have come back. And then well, I, 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 I doubt that, but I think she goes away knowing that something's going to mm -hmm. happen because she listened to her sister for years saying how much she hated that stepmom for year mm -hmm. after year after year. And then the poison, trying to buy the poison, trying to poison the mutton, whatever was going on with that mutton. Uh, the fact that Abby thinks she's going to be poisoned. Uh, uh, Lizzie goes next door and says, I think people hate my father the night before to Alice Walker saying, I think something bad is going to happen to my father. Uh, she's like laying down the breadcrumbs for days prior to the murders, Eric. You know, yeah. she she's putting it out there, you know, trying to get that poison from the guy and doing all this other stuff. Right. Well, there's so many convergences, though, with the yeah. timing. You know, it, it's like, well, why well, do you the, happen the, to the, have this? And I, I think that Morris killed, I think Morris killed Abby after he got up in that, uh, woke up in that bedroom that morning. I think he killed I, her before he even left. I think that's possible. Here's the other w w part that, could be a consideration. Dad wasn't supposed to die. I've because the only I've problem... He's dead because he comes home early. Right, because the only only issue was the inheritance. Yeah. If um, Abby's dead, no more problems. That's right. Because obviously... It, it might have been that Morse was hired or Morse was brought into the plot simply to kill Abby, hide in that closet, get out, go on his incredibly documented alibi trip uh, mm -hmm. which she immediately does at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, she's dead around that time. She, it's close to her time of death, yeah. you know, and, and that's the room he slept in. He, and it also makes, it also makes more sense because who the hell sits there for 90 freaking no, minutes? Th 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 this is a frenzy nobody. type no. of a, he, he a left. situation. He, he left. He's a butcher. He's chopped up cattle before. Uh, he he gets on that trolley car and, and goes off to his thing. He comes back at like 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He's got an alibi up the kazoo. He doesn't kill the father, but he does kill the stepmom who, keep in mind, replaced his own dead sister in this. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. That's what I was saying. That's why That's I said it was. Right. I said it's the mother's brother. That's yeah. why I said that. Yeah. I mean, Very he has been listening to do, these two sisters who are his blood, uh, complain, complain about what? And he's a hatchet expert. Oh, no, he was absolutely. known, known. It yeah. was a specialty, the way yeah. he worked meats. And yeah. that being used said, that tool. I think Abby uh, probably killed the father with it, with the iron. You mean Lizzie? I mean, Lizzie killed the father with the iron. I think that's a separate thing because somebody had to kill the father and John Morris was not back. So mm -hmm. I, I think that Lizzie... Uh, did kill the father, although I, it's hard to we believe. We still have the problem with the blood and everything. everything uh, again, she, I so. think she did it naked, and I think Bridget was involved in washing her down. I think uh, Bridget stripped her down. Bridget got her dressed. Bridget was involved. Quick, Bridget's quick. going around with the bucket. She's got a bucket of water, Bridget. She's supposed to be cleaning windows. I think she uh, literally mopped her down, hosed her down, ragged her down, and dressed her. I mean, unless Bridget does it. 
unless Bridget does it. Hmm. You know, unless you've got, you know, uh, these people from Portugal sneak and Portuguese sneaking in there and doing it as a random killing. But I doubt that. I'm going to do a, a second poll, but it's like too hard because there's multiple questions in the poll. So I'm just saying, did you think she did it? Uh, really? Well, it doesn't. Do you it, think it, she it did, did what? It? Was it, it a conspiracy? What? Right, did, right. It, I, I mean, that's yeah. why it's never been solved because she's part of a conspiracy mm -hmm. to kill these two people. It's that's why the case is so confusing. Uh, by the way, with uh, thanks to the JFK book people for getting me this book, which I recommend. I've got about five books from the book fund. Uh, the past couple of weeks. But this is the best book. This one here is written in 1967 by Victoria Lincoln. Uh, uh, I just want to point this book out because she grew up in the town and she is a wealthy Victorian woman who was a kid when this happened, but knew all the players. She was a, a six or seven year old at the time, but is in 1967 writing this book. Uh, Does that I, get into I, the culture of the time? Because that's oh so yes, oh no, no, what no. people would do this, or what they would not this do. This gets and... into it. This gets into it because she is talking as one of the culture members. Because that's a big difference. You know, oh yeah, how, no, how no, 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 no. There's a lot of books. Most of them suck. This one's the best one uh, for people who are looking to read a book about it. Okay, somebody reminded me in the chat, and I've got one last question. Then we get into the other. Okay. But, um, sure. Where did they come up with the forty wax and forty one? I mean, what? What? It's just, it's just, it just rhymed. It just rhymed. I, I think it was just a rhyming thing. I guess it just seemed like a hmm. it, interesting that they specifically picked the. Uh, they could have said twenty. I, I don't exactly. Know. They could have said twenty. I mean, it was almost twenty and ten. But anyway, I, I always thought that was interesting. But it's not "Ring Around the Rosie." Everybody keeps saying it's a knockoff of "Ring Around the Rosie." It's not. No, it's a different poem, really or different. a different ditty that it yeah. rhymes with. I forgot the which one it is, but it was of the time. Yeah. But wow. anyway, I mean, George Dexter Robinson is really the guy who is the corrupt uh, lawyer on this thing who paid all these people off. And that, that I think, is really, for me, what's fascinating about the case, that she bought her way out of this uh, case uh, by doing legal chicanery uh in terms of the case and i think knowlton knowlton knew it and he became one of the most revered straight up honest attorney generals in the state of massachusetts history as a, a, a result of this case he was bamboozled and and i think he knew what was happening uh the cop too became the first police chief of the area he was revered yeah, yes, and uh, yes. died sadly young at it when what, 1915 because of an automobile accident. Well, but keep was, it in mind, Nance yeah. O'Neill does not die until 1965. Mm -hmm. I mean, this case goes all the way into the 1960s because Nance O'Neill knew a lot about this case. They were intimate together, and uh, uh, there was a lot going on that Nance O'Neill was privy to. It's also weird that um, the apparently a lot of people died on February 2nd. I don't know why that was like different witnesses. Yeah. And then um what was it Emma died nine days after Lizzie. Oh yeah, she dies nine days. Lizzie dies of pneumonia. She's uh got gallbladder surgery. Gallbladder was removed, but then yeah. because she had successful gallbladder surgery, um, for what it's worth back then, uh 1927, two days, two years before the stock market crash. So they mm -hmm. even economically get out of that mess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she lives like a, in a perfect time period. Uh, to make money. I mean, this Gilded Age, and then she gets that insane house on the hill. I mean, just look at it from a murder point of view. She has to get that money. She wants that money. She's terrified the money's going to go to her stepmom. Well, it's she'll a, be on her ass. I mean, let's if, if, if this is somebody you hate, yeah, she could have seen this as a Cinderella situation. They both think they're going to kill each other. By the way, this goes on for two years. I mean, right. So let's say Dad did die. Yeah, Emma and. Lizzie is great having you. get get the f out. That's bye bye. Right. I'm selling the house. She just could have said, "I'm selling this house." No husband. No nobody to follow. Selling this house. Yeah, yeah, I'm selling this house. Get, goodbye. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Call your and, and maybe, maybe call your uncle. Go maybe your there uncle. was maybe there was a will that actually said that. That's very possible. That's what burned up in the stove. Let me tell you something. This is far too big of a crime to be pulled off by one Lizzie Borden by herself, in my humble opinion.
I think other people had to be aware of it. Other people had to be involved in it and other people financially benefited from it. I uh, totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Well, what does the audience think? I don't know. I don't know. Well, we've got some super chats in here, but they're just um, John. Oh, oh Minna, she Minna, probably, just here John, New or, John New Bridger when she came oh, yeah. back to Ireland. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> love, love, love the show. Creepy and all from Mary. It was kind of creepy. Uh, JS, how were there no fingerprints, no footprints, just nuts? Okay, that so one in point the barn, bothers me greatly. In the barn, it was covered with dust up in the loft, and the cop said immediately that no one had been up there because it was so dusty, and there were no mm. print, foot, or hand, uh, or anything up in that barn loft. So he, but none of this mattered in the case. None of this mattered. In fact, I once thought that she almost wanted to be indicted so she could get cleared and never have double jeopardy and never be questioned ever again. It's yeah. almost like she was contradicting herself on purpose to get mm -hmm. it over with, Eric. Yeah, almost like witness of the prosecution. Yeah. But like then that, she... was part, that was part of the reason, though. That, I mean, there's so many theories about it, but like, let's say she didn't actually wield the weapon. She was yeah. very much involved with it and, yeah. and manipulating it. So one of the theories was that Emma came back and did it but Emma that. had the perfect alibi, right? And well, as so long Moore, as Lizzie Moore got says, charged, but yeah, as Moore, Lizzie yeah, gets charged, yeah. and then somebody else did it, it's like, well, she didn't do it. So. Well, Manson wasn't there for the for the Tate killings, and 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 Tex Watson is the one stabbing people, and and Manson gets uh, arrested. True, but you know we had Bucleosi on that one, who also screwed up Kennedy. But anyway, <laughs> Pamela Clifton with um, Bobby Kennedy. By the, way, by the way, uh, Bobby Kennedy just endorsed uh, Villanueva, Villanueva here, the former sheriff, uh, who is a Trumper who's running okay. for the Board of Supervisors. Not good for him. Yeah. Uh, Lynn Blechstein, the story That's is funny. so morbid, I nearly soiled myself. It, it really is. I, I, again, it seems to be that time period between 1860 and 1890 in there that it is such a dark, macabre period. Yeah, or you go west. It was just violent. Um, Jenny's getting inky with it. I remember when Rob and Ian covered this as part of their trials. The Who's Rob and Ian? Um, that's Ian Runkle, who you know from Oh, the Rob. Runkle of the Bailey guy. That's Ian. Yes, that's Ian Runkle. And what's, it, what's his angle on Rob it? Morton is uh, Rob of Law and Lumber. They okay. did a series called Trials of the Century. So they oh, did oh. this one. They did Lindbergh. Well, just, you know, big time trials. They're two lawyers. Yeah, you know, it makes sense. Okay. They did another well, one that involved um, cannibalism. Well, I hope Jenny liked this one because I, I, I'm really into it. I, I've i read most of the top books on it. I've seen all the docs. I mean, I don't know about Runkle Bailey's thing, but I've seen, I, I know everything about this case. Um, I, I, there's stuff I had to leave out for time's sake, uh, sake, but I think we yeah, got- Yeah, we major, actually went long. <laughs> yeah, we got the major beats on this thing. It's a, it's a complicated case. Yeah, for right. sure. But before we go to locals, I, I want to definitely promote. Everybody knows that we have a meetup going and Oswald's <laughs> in trouble. Where is he? I say, nice talk. Shame if something happened to him. He's Wait, outside is, of Youngstown. Is he already in Youngstown? He's in Youngstown under Oh, oh West, he's going. Post. He's going ahead of the of the team like they do with pitches in, uh, in baseball. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was out there scoping. He's in danger. We all need to go to Youngstown and rescue him for a meetup. I mean, well, can't, can't let Oswald go by. If you have any questions about this case, I'll answer them in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, Absolutely. There's, there's a lot more to it. Uh, put it If you do come in and you're curious, I'll be happy to talk to you about the case. It is complicated. It is, it, again, it's in the most, it's in the in the backyard of Harvard. It's in the backyard of, of Puritan country. It's in the backyard of the Mayflower. I mean, the, the, the Bordens go back to the Mayflower, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason this is so interesting is because it's in Massachusetts and not in uh, Alabama, not to knock Alabama, but this is not the Scopes monkey trial is what I'm saying. Right. And it's not the old West with the shootout yeah. at yeah, Kansas yeah. city. It's you know, yeah. very dignified. State. Right. Right. That's what I meant. Yeah. So absolutely. And folks, if you do want to go to the Youngstown meetup, there is a link in the description wherever you're watching. How do I go? I mean, what do you do? You, you go to this link and then you just push the button. You click on the link and folks can go. And I actually, you know what? While we're looking at it, you can always 
Take your phone, point it at the oh, screen, oh, oh. and hit that QRL code. And um, can I put that on the, Twitter? Uh, absolutely. That would work. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, anywhere it's displayed, but a lot of people. I right. don't know if you know this, Mark, but I think uh, up to forty percent of the people watch this show on the television. So really, realistically, it could hold up their phone and you know snap, uh, you know, take that shot and scan it and go right on in. Okay, I'll try that. A lot of dots in this episode, my friend. A lot of dots. Ah, as a dot <laughs> ahead. There's a lot of dots in this episode. I I I can't connect them. That's for sure. Uh, nope. No, maybe when we go to locals, we'll connect them over on locals, and you people are not going to know what the hell's going on because you cannot get your fat asses up to go over to locals. So we are going to discuss some of the real oddities of this case over on locals that YouTube would really frown upon because they're bloodthirsty. Well, we're already demonetized. We've been demonetized since uh, the first 20 minutes or so of the show. All right. Way to go. Way to go, go you two. While we're appealing. Like you don't have enough money, you pieces of shit. So that's another reason that we really encourage people to go to Locals. It does help us a ton. Uh, hopefully nothing goes crazy, but you get notifications you know, for all the shows. So it's a great way to know, hey, there's a show today. You will get an email saying that oh, you've that's... got that show coming today. That's true. And that's all free. So you don't have to even pay. And watch the rest of it. We're going to head there now. We'll and we will see That's you. It. Stand by. Whoop, 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 whoop.